Crazy Stupid Podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. If this is your first time, we'd love for you to hit the subscribe button and the bell so that you are made aware of when we are posting new material. And we'd love for you to like this video. So we watched Minari. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. That's how they pronounce it in the movie. Okay. Essentially, this is a film that came out in 2020. It's an American drama written, directed by Lee Isaac Chung. It stars Steven Yoon, Han Yuri, Alan Kim, No Kate Cho, Young Ju Jung, and Will Patton. And the plot follows a family from South Korea who are immigrants who try to make it in the rural United States during the 19. 19- 80s. One of the first things that I thought about was the way that they explored like how generational differences can be sort of exacerbated with cultural difference when you're like a first gen immigrant to the United States. So mm-hmm. I feel like they did a really good do- good job depicting that with David and the grandma. There was obviously some generational differences, but it was also exacerbated by him just being culturally different and not necess- not really understanding her because he had a lot of American ideas of what a grandma is. Like he kept telling her like, you're not a real grandma yeah. and listing things like you don't bake cookies. I don't know what a quote unquote typical grandma is in Korean culture, but those are definitely like very like, American ideas. Yeah. And so there was like some friction between their two characters. And it was very beautiful to watch how that um, relationship developed over the course of the film to them becoming actually very close and being able to understand each other in a way that I don't think at least David did not expect. I think grandma knew it was going to happen eventually. But David, um, I don't think expected. All it took was some pee. You know, <laughs> <laughs> that kid is funny, yo. He was very funny. He was very cute. They casted him so well. When he, you thought it was gonna be the heartfelt moment, and then he just says, "What does pee taste like?" <laughs> 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 I definitely resonated with that, and it brought up, I mean, a number of things. The film does a phenomenal job at, at showing you, like the the generational differences between, like the immigrants and their kids. We talked a little bit about that Hassan Minhaj quote where he says that like sometimes our parents are trying to survive when the children's generation is trying to live. I do think sometimes immigrant parents can become too involved in the American dream and whatever they think that is like supposed to represent. Because if you were to ask, you know, anyone that moved here from their perspective country to the US that is just sort of part of like what they're sort of told from a very young age you know how like for us a lot of us are thinking like college is the next step but for them like trying to find a way to the US is almost like a semi equivalent to it it's just like of course we're going to consider that like why would we not even consider mm. this idea you know there's somewhat of like a semi fallacy that's connected to it that like things will immediately get better once you move here i think as like the u.s economy got worse over the years that american dream idea got less and less possible for any and every immigrant coming to the states that makes it even more impactful that it's from the reagan era because of what we thought his economics were going to do for you know a lot of middle lower class people and it doesn't turn out that way But I think for the father, he said to his son when they're at the chicken farm and he's asking him like, what essentially what's that smoke up in the air? And dad doesn't really want to say like what happens there. But he says the male chickens are not useful. So we have to be useful. Like you can see that is essentially his worldview. We just need to work to be useful. And I think he likes to say, I'm doing this for like the kids i'm doing this for the family i'm doing this for you i'm doing this for my parents back home and i do think there is some truth to that but i also think there is a bit of that male pride and ego that's kicking in a little bit he's almost been indoctrinated in this idea of the american dream so much that he he has to believe that it can work you've seen it a lot is like kind of part of the damage that that american propaganda that western propaganda has on immigrants because when it doesn't work Sometimes they kind of internalize that, like what's wrong with me as opposed to other people in the same racial group that I'm a part of? Why is it working for them and it's not working for us? As opposed to maybe this American dream thing just doesn't work as well as 
Americans would would probably like to consider. That's interesting because I feel like I inter I had a slightly different interpretation of his character and his motivation. Really? Yeah. To me, it seemed like I think there, I I definitely agree with the stuff about like American the American dream propaganda and and the role that that plays. But I do think like him getting the farm. I don't think that was just about being useful and making money. It seemed to me, because the thing is like, he was doing that already wherever they were before. And it seemed like whatever, what they were doing before was more, was like more stable when they were in, I think, I think they were in California Mm -hmm. before and and he was, they were doing the thing with the chickens. Right. And the implication, it seems like from the wife is like that they were perfectly fine there. They, they were able to live sustainably with what he was doing. I think he wanted more for himself. I think he saw more for himself. And I think this was some sort of like a self-realization for him. And I don't, I think the film kind of plays with the idea of like, if it's selfish or not, and definitely part of it is, but I don't, I don't know if I'm convinced that it's like a bad selfishness. I think no. part of me is like, you deserve the opportunity to go after this thing to see to to see this through for yourself. Yeah. And he even says when they're in the hospital, he's like, "They, our children, need to see me succeed, succeed at, at something. something." Yeah. I feel like there there was a little bit of that in it too. I feel like that's why when it wasn't profitable, when it wasn't, you know, he wasn't like just gonna give up on it. I think it was like this is something I need to do for myself because I need to know that I can achieve something more than just being useful. Yeah, I definitely agree. I think the biggest takeaway is your bandwidth for the other important aspects of family life mm-hmm. are sometimes put on the back burner when you're very adamant about wanting that thing to succeed. See, the film spends a lot of time getting you emotionally in, um, connected to David, the the son. And like Anne sort of operates as kind of like a figure on the side or in the background. But like she's actually like an extremely, cr- she plays an extremely crucial role. I feel like they purposefully had her role feel smaller because I feel like this is like a dynamic that exists in real life where the eldest daughter is given an immense amount of responsibility that is actually crucial to the family structure and to things working. But it's often like very thankless work that is overlooked. Yeah. And I feel like they did a really good job depicting that in the film where like it, Definitely, like David, definitely has more lines. Definitely has more screen time, and definitely has more like independent character growth and development. And Anne's presence in the film is almost always like in connection to to David. But like you see that she's like she's looking out for him. She's looking out for the grandma. She's the one. She's you can tell that she's like very responsible and like sort of like wise beyond her years of like when a crisis happens she doesn't panic she knows exactly what to do she makes quick decisions what this whole family is doing in this family structure would not work Mm -hmm. without her there but like she's still like very much in the background and i just thought that that was i'm I'm assuming that that was an intentional choice and i thought it was a very good way to depict like how this dynamic can look in real life too. I mean, yeah, it's 100% spot on. That's literally yeah. how it was for me and Jasmine growing up, like across the board. And it, it definitely shows how the son had more freedom for emotional growth because he didn't have to carry the weight of managing, of being somewhat of like a second parent as the sister had to be. When things go wrong in that household and you've got an older daughter and a younger son, like the daughter's the first person that the parents always go to. They're honestly get they get more like scrutinized. I felt it was intentional that like you saw him have a sleepover, but we didn't get her to see mm-hmm. we didn't get to see her do that, even though they were both intro we were introduced to them meeting new friends at mm-hmm. their church, but only one of them we got to see them explore something, I guess something like relatively new there is some talk of like generational wealth kind of happening there because i think what it is it's like if your parents do not have a lot of money like if you grew up in a household in poverty etc if and when you do make like 
a considerable amount of money that ends up going to take care of yeah. all the people who were taking care of you because they don't have those means. When I do make it, what I make has to go to taking care of my mom, you know. I think it just goes to show like wealth is not experienced the same way for everybody. I remember I listened to a podcast with Nicole Hannah Jones where she talked about this and like Nicole Hannah Jones is like a very I mean, you know, she's like a very successful journalist yeah. and writer. But she was talking about how like her experience with wealth is very different from another person who could be just as successful or maybe even slightly less successful than her making a, a considerable amount of money as well. But because for her, the money that she makes is going to get her niece through college or mm. it's going to, you know, that money that she is receiving is not it's it's not sitting with her the same way that it would if you were raised in a family where everybody is well off and you don't have to take care of them. Wealth is not experienced the same by everybody because not everybody has the same weight and burden as other people. Yeah. So if your family, if the people around you or if your grandparents or whatever have money, when you get money, you get more of it stays with you and goes to your kids and goes to et cetera. Versus if you are the first person or one of the few people in your family to quote unquote make it, yeah. now you're responsible for everybody. It kind of doesn't matter if it's going down a generation to a It doesn't really matter. It's the money isn't just yours. Yeah, that's the, that's yeah. the point. Yeah. I think that's accurate. I had a couple of other things. It was when the grandmother was with the son and they saw the snake. Mm -hmm. And she had that line where she was like, things that hide are more dangerous and scary. That feels like the most accurate way to describe like immigrant family dynamics. Oh my goodness. Because so many problems, issues, and emotions and feelings are not resolved they're sort of hidden they're sort of mm. put to the back burner and so much of your time is sort of presented as we just have to make sure that we make the american dream work that when other problems are happening you just sort of like avoid it you 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 keep it hidden a lot of harm and trauma could be avoided if we just said hiding it isn't going to do anything it's just kind of dormant you know and i thought that line was very spot on you saw it in the way that like he was sort of handling money right like he goes and he buys a tractor and she says how much did it cost and then he's like listen you know don't worry about it it was an investment yes it costs a lot but we'll be able to make it back and they don't really address it you know like you can see it, the camera pans on her face and you can see that she's bothered at the fact that this issue was unresolved. I think one of the underlying things that was causing a lot of the friction is like that sort of hierarchical structure that existed in their marriage. Like it was very clear, like they took on a like he head of the house, like yeah. headship sort of mm -hmm. thing, right? Which like definite, I mean, I feel like that's more a thing of like Christianity than it is like a race thing. I feel like that is just yeah. like, you know, but I was just thinking while watching the movie about how like how that structure in a marriage where the man is considered like the head of the household, the way that it forces women to just sort of have to sit back and watch as destruction is coming towards their family knowing that it's coming and not being able to do anything because they have to sort of like quote unquote submit basically to like whatever idea or desire the, mm -hmm. the man of the house has and that was definitely the situation that she was in where you as soon as they get there she's like this is not is this? She's <laughs> like this this is not going to work <laughs> And for the like most of the film, she's just having to quietly sit there and be like, I know that this isn't going to work. And I there's not there's nothing I can do because they don't make joint decisions. Mm -hmm. That's not that's not the way that their marriage works. When she finally reaches a, a point where she's like, I, I don't think I this is not going to work. His solution is not necessarily that they make a decision together. It's OK, well. I'm going to, you go and do what you want to do, but I am not giving up on this thing. It's not what she was looking for. What no. she's looking for is, can we make these decisions together? Yeah. Can we decide how we're going to move forward in this process together so that we come to something that makes sense for 
both of us and for all of us. Yeah. And I feel like that's that underlying, that's one of those underlying things that's sort of coming up in that conversation. Like she knows he's not telling her these things on purpose, but she feels like there's not much that she can do. Yeah. She feels limited in how much like power she can enact. And the only time when she really does say, put her foot down, it's like enough is enough is when she's like, I've lost faith in you. Like mm-hmm. I, I can no longer just follow your leadership and go through this because I don't trust it anymore. Yeah. Inequality in role will always lead to an inequality in value. Yeah. And the truth is that the roles that society relegates to women are often considered less important Mm -hmm. than the roles that are relegated to men. No matter how you try to spice it up with the fancy talk, that's just what it comes down to. That's just, we view we view provision as a, as something of more value than like nurturing or take care of like that's true that's how people look at it you can see the damage that it has on the husband when he has to be the one or he he's convinced himself that he has to be the one to handle everything it it takes a toll on his emotional well-being and his physical well-being. He's stressed all the time. He's less happy. I think the issue with headship and hierarchical dynamics in marriage is he, like we don't talk enough about how that harms the husbands and the toll that it takes on them because everything is high stakes for your decision, especially when you make difficult ones like I'm trying to start this business move my family out to this area because I need this business to grow what does that do for your sense of purpose and identity when those things don't work out because you know that you are the one that made all of the decision making throughout that process and so when it doesn't work out all of the fault is also on you and I think the film did a good job of really showing that he's not happy and i remember when the grandmother had that that music video playing on the tv he was she was like whenever that song played when they were still in korea it was like they fell in love again and they talked about how difficult it was when they were still in korea but it definitely felt like they were happier when they were there and the hierarchical probably still existed but it definitely felt like it was more heightened when they moved like to the States and they moved to this place outside of California. All of that pressure for one individual to have to handle is not a healthy one in, in my opinion. And you see the toll that it takes. Like he's he's making illogical decisions. The house catches on fire or the shed catches on fire. And the first thing he goes to is the vegetables. He doesn't even consider that like, oh wait, my mother-in-law might be injured right he takes the vegetables into the room when his son is getting his heart checked out and he missed the entire session when he first walks in there the doctor's wrapping up and the wife's giving him this look like what are you doing like think about how absurd you are you're walking in with a box of cabbage when your son is getting his heart checked out for something that could be like deadly you know what i mean like i so it it forces abnormal activity for men and removes the possibility of a lot of emotional maturity because that's the only thing you've given yourself capacity for. I don't know if the dad realized how the lack of opportunities to connect with your son because you're so consumed with trying to get your business off the ground might impact him later on when he gets older. Like he thinks my son is going to see everything that i've done for him and be grateful for a child that's not practical enough for him like at that stage in your life the son just needed connection and community and relationship if you place yourself in that sort of headship hierarchical position you kind of limit your opportunities of giving those sort of immediate needs that a lot of the people in your family are probably requiring I feel like while we were watching the movie, we were both like, not on the edge of our seat, but like we were constantly worried about like the worst thing happening. And I feel like this movie is very refreshing because it shows that you can make a film that explores the struggles of a certain life experience. You can show the struggles of that experience without having the worst things imaginable.
unimaginable happening to the characters of the film. And I feel like some people need to learn this lesson because I feel like, I'm gonna just speak for black people because that's what I know. There's a lot of films made by black people that are meant to explore the experiences of black people. And a lot of times they do that by just showing you the worst things that could ever happen Super to Super traumatic. Person. I'm talking about Precious. Oh my god. I'm talking about For Color Girls. We don't have to do that. Like we can make films that explore the experience of black womanhood and depict it honestly and depict the struggles of it. And we don't have to have every possible traumatic experience take place in the film. Queen and Slim. Yeah, like we, the, we don't have to do that. And I feel like this movie was just a great example of that. It does a very good job of just balancing. There, First of all, there are a lot of moments of pure joy, especially with the children and, the, and David and the grandma. And also there is like a sort of undertone of like melancholy and general like sadness about watching this family just really struggle and try to make this work. But they manage to have both of those tones exist in this film and they do it without like nobody dies like nobody like literally the whole time we were like i don't know if something's gonna happen to the son yeah. i'm the grandma i'm you know we're and just, like we're used to it yeah and in the end it's like no actually like they're actually okay i feel like there's there's a couple of things that are sort of happening i think on the one hand a lot of these directors choose pretty heavy somewhat traumatic moments and scenes in the film to really get the point across for non-black viewers but i do think Part of the problem in that calculation is a lot of these successful black movies are surviving because of black viewership and black dollars being spent in the theaters and giving you the viewership on subscriptions. And I don't always think directors are considering that fact when they make these films because you're just kind of reopening the wound when we're watching it. We already know it, you know? You're just kind of preaching to the choir in a pretty, like, depressing way. I also think Minari shows us that sometimes you don't need to have the violence happen at all. Yeah. I just, I think, and I, I mean, I was trying to think about this, but I, I, in Moonlight, I can't remember everything that happens in that movie, but I don't think horrific things happen in that movie. I think the most he got in a fight. Yeah. Right? Like, even his, quote-unquote, stepdad that they adopt, I think he dies off screen. Yeah. It's just implied that Mahershali's character dies. And you're assuming it has to do with, you know, gang violence because he was involved in that. But you don't really see it. Yeah. I feel like that's one good example. And and like that movie, I mean, first of all, it wasn't it wasn't just for a movie for black folks. It was a movie like for black queer people. Mm -hmm. And that movie spoke to a lot of people like you don't. I, I think the idea that in order to get the message across to white people, you hit that you have to depict these things. I think that's false because we live in reality. We know that the threat of it is there in the film, like when we're watching Minari, right? Like because we are aware of the threats that are present for a group of, for a group of this family, like mm -hmm. they're extremely vulnerable because of their status as immigrants, because of their financial status because of where they are located in this rural part of America, we know that they are that they are vulnerable. And so the threat is present without you. It, literally, they don't do anything in the film to make you think about it. You, you, you're in your mind. You, the fear just happens on its own. Right. Like when they go to the church and there's all those white people there. You knew. I was terrified. You knew what that meant. When when they, we went on the sleepover to the kid's house and then the dad was there the mm -hmm. next day. Maybe I was scared. Mm -hmm. Nothing happened. The Everybody was actually quite nice to them. Yeah. Like literally. But you don't even have to imply it. We live in reality. We understand that it's there. And it's nice to 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 just not make us see it through like i yeah. just think you can we you don't have to do that last thing that i would say on the film oh, this is such a pet peeve for for anyone that works for a church if you're a pastor and you're clergy <laughs> oh my gosh please stop doing this when there are visitors not everyone wants to stand up and be placed <laughs> in the spotlight it for people that are extremely introverted, they're very reserved. They like to stay in their place. They're very private. They don't like attention placed on them. I feel like church people need to recognize how 
stressful that is and how anxiety driven that is for people that do not like that experience. And they definitely highlight, like obviously there's like a racial component there because they're Korean and it's like a white dominant chase. So yeah, they're already kind of like elephant in the room and now it's even wider. But as I'm watching that, I, oh my God, I hate, I hate when churches do that. It's not an inclusive practice. It's, it's just not, you're not factoring in what every individual might need to feel like they have a church family. I think the irony is that you will still know you, because People most churches yeah, are small enough you're a stranger. that you don't actually need to have them stand up in order for people to know that they're visiting. Oh <laughs> like a lot of the time people know that you're a visitor because they've never seen your face before. <laughs> it's so annoying. Again, I thought the music was spot on. It carries so much because it, it's not like there's a lot of action. So it just kind of got me thinking about like, there's kind of like a new wave of like film composers that are kind of coming up right now. And I think for a long time, like if, if you are like me, you listen to a lot of these soundtracks from these film composers because they do such a phenomenal job. There's some clear ones that always stand out, right? Like you obviously, You've got Hans Zimmer, you've got John Williams, you've got Howard Shore. Danny Elfman has been around for a while. He did the Batman theme. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah, and he's done some other stuff. And listen, those composers paved the way. I'm always looking forward to when they do new stuff, but there are a few new ones that I do think are coming out with some bangers that are kind of going under the radar and are not getting the same hype. So I wrote down a few that I think people should at least recognize by name. So obviously we had the one in Minari that we just watched. Um, Emil Masari, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. He's already gotten an Academy Award and he's only 37, right? But then there's also probably my one of my favorites right now, like Nicholas Brittle. He's the one that did Moonlight. He's done a ton of like hot television shows right now, right? He's done things like Vice, Cruella, Succession. He did Underground Railroad. He did Don't Look Up. Um, and then obviously he did Andor, right? He has a very distinct sound where he uses strings in a way where you're just mesmerized by it, right? Then there's another one, obviously... Um, I'll name him later on, but there's another one, Michael Abels. So he was in orchestra for a number of years, but then later on, he started doing film composer work primarily with Jordan Peele. And so all of his films have had Michael Abels as his composer and he's a black man. I was going to say, which is kind of well, cool because nobody else was going to come up with that remix on us. Yeah. Like <laughs> I, I feel like we don't have that many black composers. So I just kind of shout him up right there. <laughs> We also have Natalie Holt. He, she did um, Loki, Obi-Wan. She was going to do Batgirl. But again, she has a very distinct sound, almost like a sci-fi, kind of inspired by like the 80s kind of sound, like a Spielberg E.T. kind of thing going on there. But it's like, like a modern spin on it and like just super impressive. And then we've got Justin Hurwitz. So he did La La Land, Babylon, Whiplash, another Oscar-nominated um, composer. And then, of course, who I think is probably like the best composer out here right now, Ludwig Gorsen. The man does not miss. He reminds me of Hans Zimmer, where anytime he is on a new show or film, you're introduced to a new sound that you're not familiar with because he does such in-depth research to find something that is like culturally identifiable with the group of people that he's making the music for in the film and then turns in a way where he is, it's like a consistently used throughout the entire, um, throughout the entire film. And we talked a little bit about that last time where normally Christopher Nolan will use Hans Zimmer, but his last two films, he's used Ludwig. And I'm like, bro, if you got Christopher Nolan hitting you up back to back, I feel like you're reaching goat status. Like, <laughs> I don't know in my opinion. So, Hats off to these composers. No, listen, the older ones that we've had for a while, I, I hope they continue to make music for as long as they want. But 
I think there's room for us to praise some of these younger ones that are coming up and making some incredible sounds for some of your favorite films and, and TV shows. So apparently, one of the writers for Daredevil mentioned that on their spare time, like once production was done, they had to do lift in order to like live. Like make money. Which is just kind of depressing. Um, and I, I feel like we talked a little bit about this in the car of, I feel like there's like a misconception that like Disney is like kind of like a progressive company as opposed to they just know like they're just good at PR and marketing and they'll use progressive ideas to make money. Like, like there's a difference between the two. And it's really shown with some of the language that Bob Iger has used over the last several weeks, you know, CEO of Disney. I read a few things that I thought was like pretty insightful on that situation. So for a lot of their TV shows, they don't have writers present during the filming they'll have the showrunner but they won't have writers present and um there was one reviewer that i thought made like a really good point that actually does not work in the best interest of these disney plus shows maybe you've probably noticed it but there are times where some of the lines feel kind of off like kind of cringe like yeah i probably should have done that over or maybe like wrote something you know, rewrote that so that it kind of matches the personality of the actor. But you don't have these writers there on stage or you don't have these writers there on set. And so whatever is written, it feels like there should have been one or two more takes. And so what this reviewer was saying is it actually works in the benefit of Disney to pay these writers because the quality of your shows would be better because the, the script, the lines would feel better. And so if your quality in your shows is better, like maybe more people would subscribe to your streaming platform more. It's like they're not even thinking long-term. Obviously, like I'm not a businessman, but that feels like a losing strategy for you to not have proper writers. Like a TV show like, um, Secret Invasion with some someone like Samuel Jackson, they own the the debut. I don't even think they hit a million viewers, which is kind of sad, right? Shocking. But I think that's part of the problem that like people are not people are no longer expecting good quality when it comes to Disney, particularly with Disney Plus, particularly with the MCU. And I do think you might not have this issue if you just had more writers that you were paying for the duration of the film and production process. Mm. Well, they don't care about making quality television. They just want to make money. Well, they got to do something because they're still not making money. I know the thing about raising the price. I don't know if that's going to that's going to be enough. I think right now the only streaming uh, service that's actually like making money is Netflix. Anyway, that does it for me. Same. All right, y'all. And that kind of does it. So we will see you all next time. Peace out. Mm -hmm.